All right. Um, I'm going to share my screen. That should work. That's the thing. Okay. Um, I'm delighted to present to this class by Thorsten and um, Remy. And um, so the topic that uh, we've been given is, or that we're taken is AI for smart manufacturing. And there are four of us who will uh, present this. Uh, so uh, I will do it in real time. So there are uh, three of the, you know, three students um, uh, who will join me in presenting this work. Uh, we kind of roughly divided um, uh, two lectures in four, uh, uh, a, uh, four components. I'm going to give you a broad overview, um, more from the applied perspective. Uh, and then there are three uh, technical areas um, that are very relevant to making smart manufacturing happen. Uh, one area is how do you uh, deal with data, particularly interoperability of data, um, as the data collected by machines should be you know, collectively available for decision-making. And Fadi is going to talk about that. Uh, then uh, Ruan and Devati in the next class um, uh, are going to talk about a specific area of um, uh, computer vision in manufacturing. Uh, then I don't, uh, and I'll just generally uh, introduce you to some of the other areas um, uh, briefly. So um, here is, uh, uh, you know, I um, lead or, um, Artificial Intelligence Institute of South Carolina. And um, uh, we are uh, among the, we probably are the first uh, university wide AI organization in the Southeast US, although now there are a few more. We started in 2029, uh, extensive educational activity that goes on. And um, uh, the other thing we do is to apply AI to a lot of different topics. So we have a broad variety of collaborations with uh, almost all uh, campus-wide uh, institutes, uh, campus um, colleges and schools. And uh, practically all our work involves real-world challenges, real-world data, uh, have interdisciplinary collaborators. And then we do research to solve real-world challenge, uh, often have real-world uh, deployments, real use and measurable impact. I also have a habit of uh, taking the research done in the university to spawn of company. I've done four such companies. Uh, two of them I ran as CEO uh, and two, uh, we had professional CEO or other business people driving the company. Um, so in the smart manufacturing, um, what's happening primarily in the manufacturing, um, AI uh, manufacturing is changing, uh, substantially. There's a lot of use of variety of technologies, including robots, uh, Internet of Things, and digital twins. Um, there is also not just the manufacturing, but the broader e ecosystem, such as supply chain, that is also uh, changing uh, drastically, massive disruptions or hiccups in globalization. First, there was a lot of globalization, and just in time, and um, last three, four years, there is a lot of uh, deleveraging and a lot of uh, break in the globalization. And uh, we had, um, we finished recently a project with BMW that was all on the supply chain and logistics. Uh, the data plays extremely important role. And um, there are a lot of interest in uh, sustainability. So this has led to what is called data tsunami. Um, massive amount of data that uh, is created. Robots create data, Internet of Things create data, digital twins is all you know, driven by data. You need to have accurate understanding of what's happening in the physical world so that you have a, a corresponding digital uh, twin or digital uh, shadow that you can uh, work with. And uh, you can do analysis on the digital side 
to understand what is happening on the physical side. Now, uh, when you have big data, uh, then AI can help. Um, and uh, AI can help you with recommendation, it can help you with planning, it can help you with decision making, and there are other, other, other issues such as um, uh, predicting failures or uh, finding errors, all those things, AI can help a lot or in fact plays a critical role. So um, the use of AI in manufacturing itself is expected to grow or is probably growing already at a very high rate, you know. So this was a, a um, uh, number put out by markets, uh, markets and markets where CAGI uh, annual growth rate of 57%, which is amazing, uh, kind of gangbuster. Uh, now, so here is a nice quote, it's worth, well worth, paying attention to. Industry 4.0 is the information intensive transformation of manufacturing and related industries in a connected environment of big data, people, processes, services, systems, and IIT enabled industrial assets with the generation, leverage, utilization of actionable data and information as a way and means to realize smart industry and ecosystem of industrial innovation and collaboration. It's a mouthful. But you can essentially see the significant uh, role of data. So in, in, in modern industries, basically, uh, don't run without data. And uh, most of them, uh, you know, when you have a lot of data, most of that, um, to analyze the data, you really need AI. So uh, when you talk about data, uh, you have to think about what do you do with the data. So you start with the data, you get information from the data, you then get knowledge about what data says, and then you decide to uh, have actionable information or wisdom or whatever you can act upon to get the results, right? So AI is about converting data into knowledge, insights, and actions. That's something that I formulated. So what is expected? Of, of factory of future. Well, uh, these are some of the uh, uh, components of um, how can AI be applied to uh, manufacturing? Detect defects throughout the production process. Deploy predictive maintenance to reduce downtown, downtime. Respond to real-time changes in demand across the supply chain. Validate whether integrate goods like microchips have been perfectly produced. Reduce costs of small batch or single run goods, enabling greater customization. Employee, improve employee satisfaction by shifting mundane tasks to machines. These are um, some of the tasks that are, or, or capabilities that are expected for factory of future. None of these uh, is possible without data and ability to analyze the data. So here are some, again, list of um, reasons why um, you, uh, have AI in manufacturing and uh, what are the benefits of them. So you can see on the left-hand side, uh, some of the uh, drivers, uh, you know, and uh, so direct automation, continuous production, safety, lowering the cost, improving the efficiency and such. And on the right-hand side, you have um, uh, advantages uh, kind of divided into improving production, streamlining R&D, advancing sales and marketing. These are all the uh, you know, variety of things that a uh, you know, management in factory has to pay attention to, right? So these are all the aspects. The manufacturing is not just producing a particular part. Manufacturing requires uh, a whole lot of things. Again, data is necessary to tie all of these things together. And um, different aspects of you know, the whole factory and all it takes to run the factory, uh, you know, there's different level of benefits and somebody has done the a survey. You can get slides, uh, these slides and they're, they're links for each, in each other's slides. And you can read up a lot more on, on you can read, uh, read up on, on, on the details. So um, 
what is the ch- what are the challenges one let's look at just one issue manufacturing failures right and how big a problem that is so this one uh, is kind of give you giving you a sense of what uh, what does a failure what a failure cost uh lost me lost uh, uh, money for you know uh, due, due to failure or on var- warranty remediation by just auto manufacturer or uh, you know downtime kind of broad uh, for the for the uh, us manufacturer itself and uh, the other expenditures because of uh, maintenance that is reactive or too late or preventive that is uh, suboptimal and again there are losses because of that so many of these problems could be uh, reduced by just in the mix of uh, reactive preventive predictive and proactive maintenance strategies all of these though involve data and flood of data and alarms being a fault or overwhelms operators to find fix to find and fix the problems in a timely manner so it's okay it's very important that you have the data but then you need to be able to analyze the data in a timely manner again this is where ai comes in the picture so uh, now there are a couple of interesting observations here uh, and cautions even though ai has become one of the hottest topic in the manufacturing today most manufacturers are at the start of the adoption curve so uh, a lot of you know companies realize uh, the need for ai but um, uh, have the companies actually been able to adopt ai uh, professor lesson or dr lesson says no by the time a late adopter has done all the necessary preparations early adopters will have taken considerable market share they will be able to operate at substantial lower cost with better performance in short the winners may take all and late adopters may never catch up so this is from harvard business review and you know very well known professor dr uh, thomas devonport and uh, another professor have said this so the point here is that this is something um, that really occupies a lot of attention in manufacturing now what is ai and there are many areas of ai uh, here are some of the uh, core areas of ai that i have listed uh, machine learning is very very well known robotics is very well known natural language processing understanding text is known computer vision this is very critical in manufacturing you have uh, different sensors but you have cameras throughout the uh, you know uh, manufacturing environment and uh, you have to understand those images in a timely manner so that is very important knowledge graph uh, is a way, is the model essentially uh, like description of all the parts or description of a process all that is uh, recognized in a structured representation uh, uh, of knowledge which is called knowledge graph and then conversational ai is uh, you know one of the tools that is very popular in many many industries but it also is becoming popular in manufacturing where you can talk to the system where you can interact with the system more easily so uh, just like uh, you know humans communicate with each other you can communicate with the system and that is conversational ai so let's look at one uh, uh, component of that knowledge graph and or ontology and um, also some of the other uh, social issues a uh, typically uh, uh, manufacturing uh, platform uh, uh, is seen in three uh, different layers uh, the bottom layer or end tier or uh, you know equipment layer uh, you have a lot of internet of things and devices uh, these are parts of the cells for example that you may have um, then you have fog uh, uh, tier so the bottom can also be called edge then you have fog in the middle um and uh, then you have a uh, kind of cloud so within a factory you might have uh, you know one or two or three nodes and then uh, uh, you might have uh, a cloud so very high end performance with lot of data may be done on the cloud generally speaking uh, there is a um uh, one should try to push computation closer to where the data is generated if possible when possible right so you want to do so this uh, term called edge computing 
So the idea is to, you know, a device collects the data. One option is to collect the data and then use the network to pass it on to the next layer where you are more, you know, because most of the time where a device collects the data, the device cannot do much computation. These are low power devices and they can only, um, you know, the power is used up in collecting the data. However, what if I put in um, intelligence with the device uh, where the device recognizes which data is significant enough to pass it on? There may be a lot of routine data. For example, uh, a, a, an internal things or, or a sensor is observing, uh, you know, the data and it already, uh, one option is that it collects the data and passes on all to the network. So there's a lot of traffic on the network. Another option is that it um, looks whether the data is within the acceptable range uh, of normal operation. In that case, it ignores and doesn't do anything with the data. But the moment the data is outside the range, then it passes on the data to the next layer, right? So this is called semantics or a meaning. You understand the meaning, data has all the values, but you understand what is a, um, a normal data and exceptional data. And then you uh, deal with normal data differently than exceptional data. And all you are, if, if you only pass along the exceptional data to the next uh, you know, uh, part in the network, then you can save a lot of bandwidth and correspondingly performance can you know, be improved and so on and so forth. And the same thing applies from fog layer to the cloud layer also. So here, um, you know, uh, this is uh, at McNair uh, and, uh, you know, probably at, uh, you know, uh, and at uh, West Virginia, uh, you know, you, you see that um, uh, Remy and Thorsten and their group have uh, put uh, in operation digital twins. So there is a actual cell, uh, you probably have already seen these, and then there is a digital version of that. Uh, and uh, the other lectures that cover these. Uh, a while ago, actually, I introduced a term called smart data. Uh, I, I used to run a company. Uh, it was a web search company. And uh, in a 2004 interview, I defined smart data. Uh, uh, and you can see that um, smart data is making data meaningful. Um, so, um, and then later on in uh, another paper in 2015, I used the term smart IoT. Uh, so smart data plus IoT. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that paper is fairly well cited. Um, so, um, and um, the smart IoT uh, would uh, provide you device and protocol interoperability data interpretability and semantic interpretation, right? So um, let us uh, decipher each of them. Uh, on a factory floor, there may be multiple protocols um, and, uh, each, uh, and, and each there may be devices even of the same type. Let's say device, uh, there is one device from one manufacturer that gives you temperature and another device from another manufacturer that also gives you temperature. Well, the format in which both of these, um, uh, you know, uh, represent the data may be different. The tolerance of each of the devices may be different. The reliability may be different. So there'll be a lot of uh, variety in uh, the uh, data that IOTs uh, create. And you want to make sure that regardless of the manufacturer, regardless of the a format of the data and regardless of the protocol the data uses, like MQTT is one of the protocols uh, and there are several of those, right? So regardless of the protocol it uses to communicate the data, uh, you can uh, essentially uh, pay attention to what is interesting, which is the data and not what device is used or uh, you know all the physical uh, differentiation uh, that each of them have, right? Um, and uh, it so happens that um, uh, there is a uh, you know uh, standards body called World Wide Web Consortium. All of us use the web, but uh, we may not be aware that uh, the web uh, you know my web page is seen by your page, uh, or even the presentation that I am having. All of you have, can see exactly what I am projecting. All that is because of the um, 
uh, the web uh, protocols or standards. So HTML and HTTP are very basic standards, but then there are standards um, above that uh, for semantic data. Uh, one of them is called RDF, Resource Description Framework, which Fadi will talk about. Now, um, in the same body, I proposed, uh, you know, uh, making a standard for interoperability of sensor data. So I um, defined a term in 2008 called semantic sensor web and started a uh, community effort uh, under worldwide consortium called semantic sensor networking. And that um, result of that was a, a standard from worldwide consortium and o o uh, OGC, Open Geospatial Consortium, um, uh, called semantic sensor networking, which provides a uh, uniform ability to pre um, uh, uh, represent sensor data and make that data meaningful to applications. So this is the um, uh, slide, uh, uh, you know, about uh, semantics and devices and factory floor uh, network protocol level. So um, you can see that there are a bunch of uh, devices that are shown, shown, and uh, there are you know, um, you know, different uh, uh, protocols like CoAP, MQTT that they use. And then I define the concept of semantic gateway, um, uh, which would, that gateway will be able to talk any of this protocol. And then you can, uh, you know, pass on the data to the fog and cloud where you can get other set of data, collect all the data and, you know, run your application, right? So this is a, an architecture uh, and the idea here is that, um, you know, I mentioned uh, the earlier that moving computation increases closer to data generation is something we talked about. And there is a concept of semantic gateway as a service for interoperability between devices that are using different protocols. So there is a, a paper we did on semantic um, uh, gateways. Um, and uh, I think you see the title, building the web of knowledge with smart IoT applications. Um, but the point here is that the, the takeaway here is that um, there's a whole lot of heterogeneity, um, you know, on, on a factory floor. Heterogeneity is in the devices, their manufacturer, the way they represent the data, uh, the, uh, what the data means, uh, and the protocols that they use to communicate. All of them have to be handled so that you can pay attention to what is important, which is the data, regardless of how the data is collected, which device is used to collect the data, how the data is communicated, right? And um, the, there is a huge role of what is called semantics, uh, making all that meaningful. I'll give you, uh, you know, our uh, later part of this presentation will give you some insights into what is what we can do and how it, you can do. So uh, here I'm giving you some high level, um, um, you know, understanding. It, uh, there is a lot of data. You can see both textual and sensor data. There are structured data like device status data, alarm data, system logs. There are unstructured data, uh, you know, particularly may have text like work orders, maintenance notes, warranty claims, right? These are all the data, and then you want to uh, make this data interoperable. A fundamental principle uh, or approach to do that is to annotate the data, meaning to label the data. Some of you may have uh, learned machine learning. Well, what happens in machine learning, or most of the machine learning that uh, we use are supervised machine learning. And then what we do, we label the data, right? There's a, a raw data, but we say, oh, this data is of this type or this class, right? Um, that same general, in, that becomes meaningful to train a, an AI, a, a machine learning algorithm. Similarly here, the data from all the different, you know, sources gets annotated. And the use and the annotation, uh, uh, you know, protocol or, 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 or standard called semantic sensor networking. There is a, an ontology in that, meaning a representational framework or call it a schema. If you know of database, then you have data and schema of the database. 
So uh, this represents a schema level representation for all the data and the ability to annotate individual pieces of data with respect to that schema elements uh, as levels, right? That is how the data becomes meaningful. Again, you'll see example, uh, examples later. Let me give you uh, an analogy, an example uh, from another domain. This is not manufacturing domain, but very similar situation is also applicable, is applicable to manufacturing domain. So in this application, um, uh, this is about pediatric asthma patients. Uh, we, um, uh, you know, uh, we want, we collected 29 different types of data for each of the patients. Uh, and you can see them, we have some web-based web services data, like uh, where the patient lives, what is the pollen, what is the ozone and PM 2.5. We uh, ask the patients the questions, we ask them to use the uh, the uh, devices that will tell them lung functioning. P, you see PF and FEV1, that shows lung functioning. Uh, we ask them to wear, uh, you know, uh, Fitbit, so we can get uh, sleep and uh, sleeping and activity information. And then we have uh, sensor pods uh, that can tell you um, temperature, humidity, carbon, carbon dioxide, and all those things within the home. So all this data is collected. You can see there are a lot of sensors here, a lot of uh, data. Uh, question answering data. Um, and in the, in the end of from all this data, we want to uh, create uh, what you can see on the right hand side, a dashboard where we can in real time observe all the information. Uh, you can see, for example, that um, there are some symptoms and uh, there are some triggers and their co-location, uh, you know, that um, there is a, um, uh, uh, high a peak for uh, PM 2.5 or pollen, and soon after that peak, high or, or high values for that, you see a symptom. That means you can see that there is a correlation of, uh, you know, that is possible that this particular patient is affected by uh, the high pollen or high, uh, uh, you know, particulate matter in the air, right? So uh, all that data becomes meaningful and interpreted by humans or by other applications. We need to do the same uh, in, um, in the case of uh, uh, you know, manufacturing. So we already talked about interoperability of uh, networks and protocols earlier, uh, at least at high level. And here, what you see here is the schema. Uh, you know, so uh, it says device-oriented automatic semantic annotation in IoT. So IoT is a, you know, device is an IoT, Internet of Things. And, um, you know, you can see a variety of concepts, working condition, uh, which includes humidity, ambient temperature, volt, you know, or performance, which is, uh, you know, uh, measured in uh, voltage uh, uh, or device functions or has state, state is location, running state, right? So these are all the concepts. And what is what happens is that the data created uh, and you know spun out of the device are annotated with these labels. You can see these concepts, the class classes, and that is what the annotation means. And that allows you to then uh, give data interoperability and make sense of the data. So there are uh, you know uh, sensor ML and um, ML for is markup language and semantic sensor network are some of the um, you know, standards and then semantic annotation is annotating the data uh, with the labels like the ones that you see here. Now, this is um, uh, uh, a schema uh, of the, uh, or ontology rather, of the, uh, for the semantic sensor networking, the standards effort that I had started. Uh, and there you can see there's a device in the middle and then uh, a whole bunch of things like sensor output, stimulus, uh, sensing device, the properties, uh, and all these things are um, uh, modeled. And um, so this provides framework for semantic annotation of sensor or device data. And then uh, the data can be, becomes interoperable, more you know, uh, easily understandable uh, for applications. Right? And it becomes meaningful, right? Instead of syntax, you have semantics. Here is a very um, uh, you know, intuitive understanding of um, 
um, uh, you know, going taking raw data and making it meaningful. Suppose you have a um, uh, you know um, uh, device to measure blood pressure, and that device gives you a number one fifty. Right, that's the number that device would give. This is data. Then you say you label the data, call, uh, and you say, say this is systolic blood pressure of 150 mmHg. Remember, uh, the blood pressure uh, device will give you typically three pictures, uh, three numbers: systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and pulse. So you need to label them, right? Uh, because uh, you can't mix systolic with uh, diastolic. If you have diastolic or 150, you are in a very, very bad shape, perhaps, right? So you, you should be hospitalized. Uh, so uh, a systolic uh, uh, and MMHG is the, uh, is, the, is the unit. That is information. Now, there is a, um, uh, you know, standards body that define, National Institute of Health defines what is a uh, elevated blood pressure, um, and uh, uh, it says that uh, over 130 mmHg is uh, elevated blood pressure uh, for systolic blood pressure. So then we say, okay, this is elevated blood pressure. So you can see the uh, third layer from the bottom. Um, uh, but then uh, that elevated blood pressure is not good enough to make a decision or take an action. A doctor cannot uh, prescribe medication based on elevated pressure. They have to find out, they have to rule out hyperthyroidism. Uh, so there are two uh, potential options uh, for elevated blood pressure. One is hypothyroidism and other is hypertension. So you have to figure out whether it's hypothyroidism or hypertension by running additional tests. Uh, in our case, in manufacturing, you might get another sensor data. And based on that, you can decide what it is. Just like doctor may run a lab or get another value in addition to high blood pressure to decide uh, one or the other option. So that is called actionable information or wisdom. In ISA, uh, there is an ISA 95 model, which has uh, also uh, different uh, levels uh, that they have talked about. And uh, it kind of captures different aspects, uh, but starts with sensor um, uh, and uh, uh, signals and goes up along the uh, you know, kind of manufacturing systems uh, and goes up to ERP. Now, uh, for networking, you need to also worry about so-called horizontal uh, uh, vertical networking, which we talked about in the context of um, uh, uh, device level and uh, fog level, uh, edge level, fog level, and cloud level. But there's also horizontal uh, networking, uh, uh, for example, with the suppliers or customers. Right, so your factory, but you talk to customers and suppliers and many other providers, and that is um, horizontal networking. And you need to worry about interoperability across the, that also. Um, so uh, this is putting kind of all of the things together. Now you see top left corner it says so um, physical sensors, then. Below that is digital twin setup. Then you have social inputs like stakeholders, feedback, market data. These are all physical cyber social system on the left hand side, right? Physical system, cyber, and social systems. Then you go to the second vertical, uh, you know, lineup under observations. So it's it says you have physical sensors that have a variety of observations like RTD temperature camera feed, drone image, these are all sensor observations. Similarly, digital twins have observations and social inputs have also observations like market demand. Then you extract from them signals. So you uh, extract system health or process index or task and demands, right? And you connect the uh, factory with the human needs as you can see uh, in the bottom there. And then on the right hand side, you understand these signals so that you can make decisions. So you have uh, you know, a system health in terms of uh, temperature, vibration, fatigue, and uh, you decide whether the health is good or bad. And based on that, 
decide to schedule, let's say, maintenance of the factory floor or shut down a factory, you know, a cell. All of those things, um, you know, are done after you understand those signals, right? So you go from the low level data to abstractions, ones that help you make the choices and make decisions. So now we will talk about semantic integration in manufacturing. And uh, I will ask uh, Fadi to uh, take over and go into more details on, on uh, specifically how this gets done. Fadi, are you ready? Uh, yes, Dr. Nash. Do you want me to share the screen or will you? Yeah, you can uh, share the screen. Stop. You have this. Go ahead and share the screen yourself so okay. you can drive it. Give me one second. Uh, while he brings it up, does anybody have any question? Okay, should I, I guess then I'll go ahead. Okay, so Dr. Sash, Dr. Chef talked a lot about the theoretical background of semantic web and the whole idea of semantics in computer science. However, in this section, we're going to kind of delve down and, uh, and look at one certain example of how can semantic web be used in manufacturing and how we've tried to tackle it from beginning to end. Um, and as a small introduction to semantic web, which is very close to what Dr. Shep was talking about earlier, essentially the whole idea of semantic web is to create meaning and contextualize the data that your factory floor is generating. And I like to use this example a lot when trying to explain about semantic web in manufacturing, which is this uh, pyramid that we have on this slide. We start out in the bottom layer, we have this raw data that, this, that our factory is generating. It's raw, we don't know, we, it, does, it doesn't have context. So it doesn't give, there isn't much use for it if it is just the raw data value itself. So what we have to do is we can actually utilize semantic web to contextualize and be able to use this data for more meaningful actions. The first step to be able to do that is to, uh, is to link this certain data value to different entities in our lab, in, in your uh, factory floor. So for example, one, one, uh, one way to create con uh, context for a data tag is by giving it a location value a geographic or by linking it to different assets that you have already. In our example here, we kind of link this data value to a sensor that we have in our lab, which is also attached to a certain robot. So now we know that this data value is actually coming from a sensor in this location. So instead of just having the, the, act, the value by itself, we can be can able to have more information about it uh, to know, to be able to use it further on. And once we have this information, this is when we can start to create uh, insights that are rather implicit rather than actually have, which are not usually there. So in the, this example, what, now that we have our contextualized data, we can actually, we can kind of deduce or we can reason that this value that's, that's given on the, from this sensor on this robot can entail that are the gripper on this robot is closed. So now that now so now this is infer this is actually knowledge. These are insights that we can use for to either continue our manufacturing process or to or to stop it or to know if there's something that's uh, if there's something wrong that's happening. And just like I said, after you have this knowledge, after you know that your gripper is closed, in this example, well, the gripper is closed. That means we can continue our path. And so this is a small as just a small example of how semantic web can actually be used to uh, move manufacturing processes forward rather than and help us create insights that wouldn't uh, traditionally be there. Now, how do we how do we reach this level? How can we uh, actually get to the information stage from our raw data? Well, that's one of the things that uh, I was kind of looking at during my uh, master's thesis, and one of the main standards that is, that's used to create this information level is to actually use a modeling language, which is RDF. Now RDF stands for Resource Description Framework. And in, as, in all, uh, as in all ontologies, it's also, it can be split up into two sections. 
the first section, which we have in uh, in our uh, on the left side at the left side here, on the the top part is the actual schema. So the schema defines your classes and it defines your relationships. So in an RDF, RDFs are uh, mainly compromised out of triples. Each uh, a triple is an entity with a relationship and another entity. So uh, the the um, triples can be viewed in the bottom side, which are the actual instances. After you've defined your ontology or your schema, and you've defined all the uh, met all the data about it, you can start instancing each uh, entity for the certain uh, for the certain asset that you have. So as a small uh, uh, as a small uh, kind of if anyone is familiar with with uh, traditional coding, uh, libraries are nothing but a schema or, or, uh, or a uh, or uh, ontology. So having a variable in Python, it comes with its own light, with its, with its own definitions and functions. And this is similar in that way, where we have the traditional libraries and ontologies, and then we instance them to be able to create these links and relationships between our, between our different assets. So RDF is, is the modeling language that's predominantly used uh, to be able to create this uh, contextualization of data. Now, now that we kind of talked about the technologies, let's, let's think about how we can actually use these technologies to be able to get to one certain example. So Dr. Schatz also previously spoke, to, spoke about one of the capabilities of uh, factories of the future, which is, well, your factories need to be able to continue their manufacturing processes, even if there is uh, defects or malfunctions in your uh, factory floor. And this is exactly what we're going to try to achieve here using Semantic Web as the approach. Now, how can Semantic Web be used for that? So the Semantic Web deals with interoperability of data. And so if we have all these, uh, if we have all the data being utilized with a certain standard, so that means your machines in theory can be able to reach to all the different uh, information that it needs to be able to uh, deduce the knowledge of whether of what uh, of what is currently happening and then what needs to happen next in our certain example here we're going to be uh, integrating a lot of different uh, information sources the first one is the actual data generated from the factory floor so you have the value from the sensor we uh, we need to look at how we're going to take this value from the sensor and integrate it with different uh, information sources and then the second two are the domain knowledge and the manufacturer specifications, which I will talk about in the next slide. However, once we integrate all of these together, we can actually use Semantic Web to deduce, well, is our, is our current sensor functioning or not? And based on that, we can see if it is, then what should we do? And if it is not, then what should we do then? First step, the first step to actually uh, realize this use case is how are we going to uh, is what what's the information that we need to integrate well like i said we have the domain knowledge and the manufacturer specifications and those hopefully will be will already be uh, present to the different assets that we have in the standards that are required however our generated data that's coming from the factory floor essentially comes in a raw data format which if we go back up here you can see this is it's still in the bottom layer. And so what needs to happen is we need to figure out how we're going to translate or annotate the raw data to be able to integrate it with the other information sources. And this essentially is a breakdown of all the, of all the different information that might be used or that need to be used for us to be able to uh, realize this use case. Starting from the left to right, the first, the first column shows us the factory data that generated, uh, the, the data that's generated locally. And this, uh, this information also utilizes the semantic sensor network ontology, which was one of the standards that Dr. Chef was uh, speaking about earlier as well. So uh, the, essentially what the semantic, what this ontology defines is how can these entities be linked together so that all the different assets know how the relate, what, what are the relationships that it should be looking for and how to query through this information to reach the correct entity. And in our example here, we have a sensor, which is a potentiometer. 
this potentiometer gives us a certain value. Uh, and uh, as you can see as well, the top part shows us the schema, which is how the ontology is mapped out. And the bottom part shows us the actual instancing of the schema, which is how now that we have our library, how are we actually using it in our certain use case. The middle column has the manufacturer specification. Essentially, this, this information is used for us to know what is, how is a sensor actually, how is this sensor supposed to act? So what's the regular uh, output range that we should expect from the sensor? And finally, the third one is the domain knowledge in our case, which is in our certain factory floor, what are the sensors that, are, that can be used to move forward with a certain manufacturing process? So uh, in our case, we can either use a potentiometer or a timer to find out if, uh, if whatever, maybe if the robot is in position or if the robot's gripper has closed and so and we can move forward from there. So moving back to one of the main issues of this uh, of this use case is well our lab gives us the uh, I mean sorry our factory floor gives us the raw data, but how are we supposed to translate or annotate it to be able to use it in Semantic Web? Well, um, well one of the one of the applications that I was able to develop through our, uh, during my master's thesis was uh, was an application that was deployed on an edge device in our uh, future factories lab, which reads in the raw data, reads in the actual value that the sensor is uh, out is generating, and then annotate it or translate it to RDF using the standards that we talked about earlier. And so this application is actually deployed right now, and it works in real time where it, it reads the data that's get, it's getting from the conveyors or robots and sensors, and then within the edge device, uh, translates it to a RDF model, which uh, uses the uh, uh, semantic sensor network ontology. And this was done through a simple uh, toolkit, which, which, uh, uh, which needs the user to create the mapping that uh, we are looking to use. And then after the mapping is created, then this toolkit can actually link this different data to the entities that you created in your uh, mapping. And of course, this was uh, all the communication uh, was even set up using different uh, protocols, whether it was MQTT or OPC. Now, of course, now this might look a bit complicated, but we don't really need to look at the actual what the actual code is. However, the whole idea of this was to just kind of showcase that now that we have our uh, now that we have our semantic data, our, our data that's semantically annotated, and we have all the different information from before, we how we need to integrate them together to create this overall knowledge graph, which can uh, show. Uh, which we can then use to deduce insights or knowledge and then be able to create wisdom out of it. Now, one of the main issues with uh, actually with reasoning and deducing insights is that it is uh, its capabilities are limited at the edge level. And so what uh, I did in during my master's was, well, at the edge level, only the annotation was done and the transformation. And then after that, uh, a more processing uh, intensive device was used to be able to reason through the knowledge graph to be able to get to, to be able to deduce uh, further knowledge. And uh, the reasoning engine that was used was Jenna, which is a also a, a, an open source engine that can be used. And this is just an example code of uh, what actually how what's inside the reasoning uh, code that I used to be able to deduce. However, Okay, this is where I need what I want to get to, which is this is basically uh, after you have all this uh, the information integrated together, you create uh, the output of this integration is essentially a knowledge graph that contains all this different data that I talked about, all this inf different information that I talked about earlier. So uh, all of the different triples and entities that are in this bottom layer have actually were actually integrated together to create one knowledge graph that has all this information, and then at one once that is done. This knowledge graph was reasoned on to be able to create new entities that can give us insights on, that's, uh, that are not explicitly there. And in our case here, uh, the value that the potentiometer was giving us was outside the recommended output range. And so you can see that the reasoning engine created a new entity in our knowledge graphs that tells us, well, this potentiometer needs to be changed. 
And now, now we know, well, now ba based on that, we can start to actually make a decision. And this is just an example of how the knowledge graph would look like if the uh, potentiometer did not need to be changed. Uh, and so this is essentially, it just takes what value the potentiometer state is giving us and then uses the different information that we have in our knowledge graph to be able to create this new entity uh, that we can use. Uh, so I just, one last thing I wanted to touch, up, touch upon is, sorry, one sec. I just wanna showcase the overall application that was developed here, just to kind of have a broader view of what was actually done. So let's imagine how, how this, let's kind of look at how all this work fits in together. At first you have this raw, the sensor that's creating data for you. This, uh, this data gets semantically annotated and becomes information that now you can use within the semantic web to be able to uh, integrate in a knowledge graph alongside information that's, uh, that's uh, usually accessed publicly, such as domain knowledge and manufacturer specifications. Now that you have this knowledge graph, you can actually ap uh, apply reasoning mechanisms to be able to uh, reach new entities, which was the last slide that I showed you. The last, the last entity was, well, does my potentiometer need to be changed or is it fine? And after that new entity was uh, established, we can start querying through the knowledge graph to be able to decide if the sensor is malfunctioning or not, because now that information is available for us in our knowledge graph. And once it is, and once we know what it, if it is or not, we can actually relay the decision back to our controller in the uh, factory what, on whether on which sensor we should use, uh, because now we know which sensor is working and which one is not. And after the controller actually knows that decision, it can go back to uh, sending that decision and uh, to the, our actual to our actuating equipment such as robots and so on. Okay, uh, Dr. Chet, I believe that's the uh, whole yeah. section. I think uh, uh, this last one, uh, you know, uh, last slides brings everything together. Um, uh, Fadi, we can talk a bit offline. Um, there are other things that we can add there about interoperability and a few other things that uh, probably are also important takeaway. But I think in, in the sense that, you know, your raw data and uh, consider an example where um, you want to, uh, starting with sensor generated data that leads to robot to stop the operation or for robot to open the, hand or close hand or you know or stop doing what it is doing that is the whole process that fadi just showed you in the last slide and um, uh, what is uh, interesting is that it takes a lot of um, components and technologies to get there in a um, uh, standardized and repeatable way uh, because you know, you want to ro operate the robot uh, based on the data, but you have a lot of different kinds of data, a lot of different devices. So the slide that, uh, you know, the, the whole diagram that Fadi showed needs to be um, usable for broad variety of sensors, not just one sensor, right? And that um, it needs to be, adaptable to um, broad variety of uh, manufacturing scenarios. So the corresponding domain knowledge uh, and manufacturer specifications and other knowledge necessary for a uh, representative knowledge graph, that will vary. And then uh, the uh, rules and or techniques uh, to make sense of decision would vary. So what you are seeing here, is not just for a single sensor, but it is for the whole thing that happens in on the cell uh, that um, uh, you know Mechner has. Uh, there are broad variety of sensors. There is a sensor that measures temperature in robot arm. There is a sensor about gripping. 
There is a sensor that takes photograph of the part as held by the robot arm, and so on and so forth. So all of them, uh, you know, this this whole process uh, needs to work continuously for all of these sensors, all of the um, not just this cell but other type of cell. If I change the production on the cell from uh, one part to another part or one assembly to another assembly, with all those variations, you got to have these things working. And that so this has to be pretty general purpose and making all that happen takes uh, you requires you to take data from this raw data format all the way to the decision to activate a robot. And then continue the cycle and continue monitoring uh, this whole thing. Now, of, of course, this is just one example of semantic web uh, in manufacturing. However, of course, there's so many more, there's so many more advantages of, of, of actually using this in real manufacturing, which is, well, the whole idea of it is you're going to have the standardized information that's accessible by your machines uh, th uh, thanks to semantic web ontologies and standards that have been uh, established before. And then since this information is accessible by your machines then any kind, any type of information that it needs is already there for it. So another example could be, um, if a if you're trying to cut down on costs in your manufacturing process, well, uh, electricity rates may also be some kind of domain knowledge that is uh, that get, that your machines can access. And based on the electricity rates, your machines can start to create decisions on when to uh, manufacture more and when to take and when to manufacture when to manufacture less. So you have less cost of uh, of uh, actual production. All right, any questions, guys? All right, if none, uh, then I think we'll um, uh, end this class today. Thorsten, do you want to say anything or Remy, uh, Remy and... Um,